we are all about sharing software and data skills through community-based training. Despite the name, we are not about woodworking. Um, we came to this name because we became a collection of lesson programs. The original was software carpentry, um, but that was a great idea. It inspired some other good ideas that had some similarities and differences. Um, so then there came along data carpentry and library carpentry, and these are all under the umbrella. Um, of our larger organization and core team, which we uh, refer to, and community, which we refer to as the Carpentry. The Carpentries builds global capacity in essential data and computational skills for conducting efficient, open, and reproducible research. We train and foster an active, inclusive, and diverse community of volunteers that teach, promote, and model the importance of software and data and research. We collaboratively develop openly available lessons and deliver those lessons using evidence-based teaching practices, which we train our instructors in. And we focus on people co conducting and supporting research, so researchers and research adjacent communities. We are a global organization. Um, Carpentry's workshops happen anywhere that somebody decides to get certified and run a carpentry's workshop. Um, so uh, this has happened in all kinds of interesting places around the globe. We were pretty excited when we got to add Antarctica to our list. Um, and we also get excited when we get to add uh, all kinds of new places that happens all the time. Uh, we have a, a very diverse global community that makes us very proud. And I'll point out, we have, uh, we list 3,703 official Carpentries workshops to date. Uh, we know there are a lot of other Carpentries derived activities that are happening out there uh, that we are trying to get better at keeping track of. Um, so our impact probably exceeds this substantially. But as far as official workshops, that's the count. We have certified 4,148 instructors to date. And we don't track our learners, um, but we assume about 25 per workshop. So, so pretty big impact so far. Um, again, we train our instructors in teaching practices. So our workshops, um, and we also work a lot on collaborative lesson development. So our workshops are designed to teach skills that are immediately useful. Um, they, uh, we train our instructors to use live coding and frequent formative assessment. We respect the novice experience. Um, our, our workshops are primarily entry level oriented um, at getting people started on uh, in a context of a, a broader context of self training that we know is happening out there. Um, so getting people over that initial hump um, and we respect that experience by explicitly addressing motivation to to persevere uh, once the workshop is complete. And um, important to that motivation process, we teach our instructors to normalize errors and demonstrate recovery from errors, which is just super important to that learning process. Our curricula are freely available on CCBY licensed. All Carpentry's curricula are unified around certain characteristics. They provide novice level training. We have some that are a little more intermediate than others, um, but overall that's a unifying feature. They're organized around a two-day workshop premise. That doesn't mean that you can't break it up in different ways, um, but we, we encourage each of the lesson programs has different ways that they encourage you to collect different lessons together to provide a complete introduction. And generally that's around a two-day format uh, in total. Um, they're taught by volunteer instructors applying Carpentry's teaching practices, and they address gaps in computational skills that are commonly found uh, in research environments. Software Carpentry, they, they differ in how modular they are and how discipline specific they are. So Software Carpentry workshops tend to be much more general. If we don't have a discipline specific workshop for your uh, discipline, then Software Carpentry workshops are a good choice. Um, so if you just, or if you just need to know, know that you happen to need to know our Python, Unix, GitHub, these are, these are generally focused um, things. 
Data carpentry is more discipline specific and very workflow oriented. So they don't tend to be very modular. They're following a workflow from beginning to end over the course of a two day workshop. And library carpentry events share that discipline specific specificity, but are also designed to be more modular because in a library environment, um, you, they tend to be much more oriented around <clears throat> um, smaller events that they're gonna create a, a collection of over time. Um, and those are oriented towards people in library and information related roles. We have a lot of different data carpentry uh, workshops there. There's a few listed here, ecology, genomics, GIS. We also have astronomy, we have chemistry, we have social sciences. So I encourage you to go check out what we have there. Um, and in addition to that, we have a lot of interest in lesson development in our communities. So we have a platform where people can come and contribute lessons and share them. Um, and we are also in the process of developing a peer review process by which uh, mature lessons from the incubator can join our lesson program someday uh, by going through peer review in the Carpentries Lab. Our instructors bring basic technical skills. So we don't train people to teach by teaching them Python, right? Uh, they, they We do expect people to come if they wanna be instructors with some basic knowledge, but they don't have to be experts. They just need to know enough to be able to teach at the introductory level. And we encourage people actually to come when they haven't fully developed their skills because teaching is a great way to continue learning. So even though we don't pro provide intermediate workshops, we do provide opportunities to learn that sort of our intermediate level training is is by serving as a helper by serving as an instructor you you do continue to learn uh, as you go and we hear this from instructors all the time when people become certified they can co-teach um, self-organized workshops locally um, they can also support and often do support the development of inclusive vibrant local communities of practice and they can also volunteer with our global community um, to teach centrally organized workshops with other Carpentries instructors across the globe. These occur online and in person. When they're in person, sometimes you get to travel to cool places um, and build skills and connections across the globe. What does a local community look like? Um, Carpentries communities can include lots of different roles. Often people will kind of pass back and forth between these different roles, but they generally include instructors, helpers. Um, we, we like to have a, a community in our workshops. There's always at least two instructors and we encourage uh, communities to bring a lot of helpers to, to help make sure that no one gets left behind. Um, those local communities often do include learners. <clears throat> we don't picture hosts in this diagram. Um, but they are that's a very important role and often sort of that community coordinator role making sure that the meetings get scheduled and everything is, is running smoothly um, helps a lot and as communities mature they often choose to add an instructor trainer um, that doesn't mean they can train as many people as they want we have complications to our instructor training program but it does mean that they have someone on the ground who can support their instructors in developing their practice as they progress um, so there are lots of different ways to get involved. Um, we love to have new community members um, and we love to take questions about ways to ways to get involved. Um, so there's links if you're interested in becoming an instructor. We do have free and paid pathways uh, for individuals who are interested in, in becoming an instructor. It is possible to just request a workshop for our community and we will try to recruit instructors from our global pool um to to share that with you there is a fee for that and there can be a wait for certain programs um we are a volunteer run effort um the best you can get the best of both worlds by championing a membership at your institution where you get instructor training and a certain number of workshops in a package or you can just follow us along for a little while and see what's going on get our newsletter follow us on twitter and i'm happy to take questions all right, thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, data science training has been something I've been very passionate about for a while. Um, I'm gonna start just giving you a little background to see where I'm coming from, um, especially because it fits into the context of the XD programs that occur at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science, where I am the research lead, a research lead in environmental and biological sciences. 
So my background's in biology. It was very specific. And then it's kind of wound its way through different um, specialties over the years where like a lot of people um, coming from almost any domain in research at the moment, you become inundated with data, almost drowning in data, <laughs> um, depending on um, what your project is. And that was definitely me. So a lot of researchers, um, like a lot of researchers, I was not expecting to become so involved with data science programming and data science training when I started my career. Um, but the data came in and I, I was passionate about answering my <laughs> research questions and I begrudgingly learned R. Then it became a challenge to really find how to go further with that. So like a lot of other researchers, I borrowed scripts, I joined Twitter, reached out for help online. I bugged a lot of people for help. This is a shout out to Carpentries. <laughs> I got involved with, which was software carpentry to start and data carpentries, um, creating tutorials and learning the community there, understanding how people learn programming and then got involved with our OpenSci, which is a great organization, if you haven't heard of it, that helps um, maintain software and building best software pra practices. And then at the end of my PhD, I was like, oh no, I love data science. <laughs> I um, I really fell in love with what the tool, data science as a tool, and it not only fueled my research, but it really changed how I thought about research. It expanded how I approached my questions, and I began to ask bigger and bigger questions, and it made me love scientific research more. So I also learned something very important about how we learn data science. And I know this is changing, but at the time, gaining those skills, if you didn't notice, it wasn't from a university course. Uh, it came from people, uh, people who could take the time to make their work open. Um, and the whole process made me a fierce, lifelong open science and open source advocate. Because in the end, it comes down to access of knowledge. And I wouldn't have fell in love with data science and found my, my place here in my career um, without those good people doing good open science and open source work. Also a theme when I was learning these skills was it didn't matter where the knowledge came from. It didn't matter um, the kinds of people, but also the domain. When I was learning, I was learning to perform my re my biological research from non-biologists, economists, software developers, astronomers, linguists. It didn't matter. Wherever I could get that, that information, I just gobbled it up. So when I was deciding to do my postdoc, I knew I wanted to focus on computational work, but I also wanted to live with these um, open science and open source philosophies and work with good people. So I joined um, for my postdoc, I did computational genomics in a, uh, in a very open <laughs> science lab of Michael Eisen. And I became a fellow at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science, whereas where that's where I am today. So BIDS, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, it began in 2013, and it's really a central hub for data intensive research, uh, open source software and data science training programs at uh, University of California, Berkeley. This is a very multidisciplinary institute, uh, which is really exciting to work there. Some days I'll be talking to a software engineer and the next day I'll be talking to someone uh, looking at, I don't know, decoding ancient languages. Um, behind everything that BIDS does, there is this underlying philosophy of open science, open source, and a lot of good people. So I really found my community um, with these philosophies. So with these main three research areas, I, of course, I'm going to focus on training. So 
we have fellowship programs for postdocs, graduate students. We hold seminar series. We have working groups that span um, machine learning to diversity and inclusion to just best practices. But also we have our flagship training program, which is the cross-domain workshops, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today a little bit. So cross-domain XD workshops is what we call them. And this is bringing together an interdisciplinary group of researchers, learners, and entrepreneurs who work with the same primary source of data. So we're kind of a, a mix between the hack weeks, except which Anthony will talk to you about. Um, the structure is similar, except instead of being domain focused, we focus on a particular type of data. And so we've had TextXD and ImageXD are the ones we have annually. Then we've also dabbled in NetworksXD. And then University of Pittsburgh has recently um, hosted an audio XD. So the goals of the workshop are to support a diverse community for data intensive researchers who work on, this says image data, but any type of data, image is a great example. Um, bring researchers together to learn methodology, language, and solve challenges on how to handle data and build collaborations for future research and tool building. And so why interdisciplinary? One, you need that point of knowledge to have a conversation. Um, and we find that this is very powerful. If you are working on image data, you are working with similar workflows, whether you be an astronomer or um, a neuroscientist. Data type is a really unifying thread for how we handle um, data problems. This also is a cross-pollination of techni techniques to solve similar problems. Um, for instance, if you're doing image data, uh, one area of research might be further along than another in a certain in a certain role. My, uh, a colleague of mine, Miriam Varath, just mentioned a really good point at one of the image analysis, or one of the image XDs in which astronomy has been, you know, battling, handling large amounts of data for a long time, and then they've solved the, a lot of the problems. Um, and then in health, health has been really focused on identification of particular uh, particular shapes and things things like that. So when they come together, those fields can kind of create a, a better a better uh, foundation of knowledge. It also allows you to identify redundancies occurring in in different fields. so you're not all creating the same tool that can be used um, across fields and, of course, it spurs creativity in solving complex problems. So the audience is designed for researchers who are already proficient in and understand the challenges involving with handling a specific type of data. So um, one of the ways to think about this, like attendee fit, is that although participants range from trainees to those in established careers, and we wanna make sure that there is a diversity in that regard, all have processed and analyzed a particular type of data. So they've already been working with image data if they're coming to ImageXD. So um, someone who maybe had taken several intro to carpentry workshops already, and they're already implementing their research, they can then come to XD event to learn uh, more advanced techniques, share their knowledge, and then collaborate on further projects. So the first uh, XD was Image XD. Um, it was 50 researchers from the fields of health, computer science, agriculture, biology, astronomy, and they were all united by handling image data. And they were they got together to discuss and identify common problems, algorithms, and tools to advance this research. Um, this excitement it. It left everyone buzzing with the knowledge they gained um, and especially for finding this new communities. 
And the excitement spurred from the first event helped launch and sustain a program um, that BIDS is really proud of now. So since 2016, we've had 12 XD events. We've had the annual Image XD, annual Tax XD, and then, like I mentioned previously, the Network and Audio XD. So the structure of the events um, are similar to the hack weeks that Anthony is going to talk about. Uh, there's structured time for talks, structured time for demos and lessons, but there's also unstructured time, kind of unconference style, where the attendees can uh, find time to talk about, collaborate um, in smaller groups to really make those connections uh, with the people who are coming to these events. We've also had hackathons, um, and then of course these breakout events, uh, breakout groups. And so each XD event, we're pretty experimental. So each XD event, we've, we refine the process every year. So um, there's a lot of room to grow and understand exactly where, what we need from these events, depending on who's attending. So that being said, I just wanted to give a shout out for our next event, which I am happy to say is a partnership with ADSA. Um, it's going to be Image XD uh, 2023, and that'll be March 16th and 17th in Irvine, California. And we the applications are unfortunately closed, but keep an eye on that for um, any research products that come from that meeting and here's a way to here are a few ways to find me if you want to connect so my name is anthony art and i'm a data science fellow at the university of washington's e-science institute um, we are the hub of data intensive discovery on the university of washington campus our role is to empower people to use data science tools to answer fundamental questions and we do this through a variety of programs including incubators and um, summer schools and office hours and um, hack weeks, which is what I will be talking to you about today. I am the lead of the hack week program that we've been running and developing over the last uh, eight, 10 years or so. So the mission of the hack week is to provide hands on opportunities for people to learn the tools of open source science in a welcoming and collaborative environment. And we do this through focusing on our four core values. Um, we really partner and engage with communities in this work. We invite community members to be deeply embedded in the development and the planning of a Hack Week so that we can meet the emergent needs of individual communities and tailor the mission, uh, tailor the Hack Week design to the particular needs that are occurring within that group. Um, so by definition, then, these events are very co-creative. It's not a group of experts coming in from the data science lab to tell everyone death practices. Rather, it's all of us coming together to say, what is emerging in this community? Where are people at? Let's meet people um, <clears throat> where they have um, blocking points and challenges, and then develop tutorials and content that will help them develop and move forward. Um, all of the content that we create, whether it's tutorials or open project work, is highly interactive and immersive because we know from adult learning and pedagogy that people learn best when they can really begin to use the things that they're learning and get in a hands-on kind of um, capacity. And then finally, our work is very um, focused on uh, advancing the goals of open source science, so uh, reproducibility and data sharing, and giving people um, credit for the work that's been done in their communities. Specifically, what happens at a Hack Week? Well, we have usually in the mornings a series of tutorials that are developed and offered by community members, so there's a lot of peer learning that goes on. And this is to sort of address the specific needs of that community. And then there will be projects or open hacking time, usually in the afternoons. Um, people will pitch an idea, sometimes in advance of the hack week. And then small teams, usually six to eight people, will form around that idea and will help them uh, scope their work over the span of the week. And then they'll collaborate during this open hacking time 
and then present their work to the community at the end of the hack week. We really have a lot of intention around creating positive learning environments. And we do this through hiring professional facilitators. We employ technical education specialists here at the eScience Institute to guide our events. What this looks like is um, community building activities, such as icebreakers and networking activities that are interspersed throughout the hack week. We really attend to team dynamics, not only by teaching about the best practices for interacting in small groups and some of the challenges that can go along with working with brand new people that you haven't uh, worked with before, but also embedding facilitators and helpers within the project teams to help people navigate and uh, develop best practices for working together. And then we have a code of conduct, which is an explicit mechanism in place for people to report any unacceptable behaviors. So you might be getting a sense that there is quite a lot of planning that goes into a hack week. And over the years, we've developed this life cycle of putting together an event that we think is um, really ideal for this complex and rapidly changing technology landscape. We think this is a very adaptive model we're constantly shifting and developing it as time goes on, as we learn new things. So upstream of an event, we'll gather an organizing team together, uh, sometimes 20 or 30 people coming together who are not only developing content for the event, but also we're doing a little bit of training for these folks. We're teaching people best practices in pedagogy and in guiding small group collaborations. So that's a little bit of professional development that we offer there as well. Then during the hack week, as I said, we have the facilitation, the tutorial project work. And as we come out of a hack week, we'll do formal evaluation procedures. So quantitative as well as focus groups um, of folks who'd like to share feedback with us. And then we use that after an event to debrief, learn what went well, what could be improved, and then continue experimenting with new things every year, keep trying to uh, try new things and see how we can evolve going forward. <clears throat> We've offered a number of hack weeks over the years, and the popularity of these events has led us to develop what we're calling the hack week as a service model. So some of us here at the Science Institute are building a program where we can um, pull out the elements of the hack week that we really know well, which is to say the model and the scaffolding and the facilitation work, and then defining roles really clearly for our community partners who come in with these specific needs for their community. And so we've defined all these different roles that are needed to put on an event, everything from the planning and logistics to the tutorial delivery and education, community building and the project work, and of course, helpers to guide all of this process. And we have folks from both the science side and then community partners coming together in those roles to uh, deliver an event. So here's what that looks like. This is the team uh, here at the Science Institute um, involved in sort of that core work that can be applied to any event in any domain. Uh, we have expertise in the model itself and in facilitating and guiding people to develop content for their community. And then this would be a typical organizing team for a particular event. This is our team from a community called SnowX. This is a NASA funded mission that brings together multiple different satellites and platforms to measure snow distribution. So we have, I don't know, 25 or so folks here coming together to plan our event from last year. Here's a sample curriculum. Again, this is from last year's SnowX event funded by NASA. We start the week teaching uh, tutorials in the fundamental tools, GitHub, Jupyter Hub, Notebooks, and some of the core Python tools. We're not teaching everything from scratch, and I'll touch on this a little bit later and some really interesting overlap with carpentries and uh, all these different ways that we can um, get people up to speed in those core fundamentals. Um, on day two, we're then teaching how do you access data from this particular platform. So we're partnering. We have folks coming in from federal data centers to teach people what are the best practices and lowering the barrier to getting at the data. 
And then uh, we transition to learning about the data itself and the algorithms and the processing methods for, in this case, these different satellite missions. And near the end of the week, we'll get into more um, complex topics like modeling, machine learning, where we're integrating products across platforms, modeling and, and you know, looking at applications. On the project side, here's an example of kind of an ideal outcome, not something we require, of course, but this was one of uh, our, our success stories from an event back in 2019. And this is another NASA mission focused on measuring snow and ice height using lasers. Uh, a project team was formed uh, out of the recognition that uh, we had some folks looking around the room saying, people are kind of using all different ways to get at these core data sets. Wouldn't it be nice if we could harmonize that into one toolkit? And so they formed a project around that. And after five days, you know, built a bit of the foundation for that. Here we are a few years later, a very um, mature open science toolkit, the Python library called IcePix, that still has a lot of those members who had just met each other at that 2019 event. So the Hack Weeks can really be a catalyst for these open science community libraries and particularly well suited, I think, to these satellite missions. This was just launched in 2019. So gathering a community together early in the lifespan of a, of a satellite is, is a really good fit, we think. <clears throat> so moving forward, um, I'm really interested in the Hack Week model as it might fit into some of these broader efforts at education and community building. So I see it really as one component as a, of a larger long-term community engagement. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there's still you know, a lot of need for people to learn those core skills or maybe transition from other programming languages to uh, more open science tools. And so this has been one of the challenges is how do we get everyone to sort of an even level as they come into an event? Um, we have offered Carpentry's uh, events upstream of a hack before, and we'd like to continue exploring that. And this is a way to uh, not only help people brush up on skills, but also to invite new people into our communities and help them realize you know, they can acquire these course skills and then arrive a little bit more prepared for what tends to be a fairly intensive week of work. So coming in then to the hack week where we have the tutorials and projects, networking and community building. And then our hope is that spinning out of that, we can continue to engage with project teams and the communities that form at that event, going into maybe deeper dives. We can maybe offer different tutorials virtually, we can maybe do some peer mentoring where we'll partner with the project teams who'd like to still be meeting, say, once a month and just help continue moving forward on the project as it evolves. Um, I also see Hack Weeks as uh, one of many of the tools that we might employ to foster a more inclusive and diverse community. So these are just some of the ways that we've been working uh, to move forward in that direction. We've been building relationships with some tribal colleges and universities. And as those relationships develop, our hope is to begin inviting students and faculty to our Hack Weeks for organization and participation in the event. And not only recruiting and inviting people, but also finding ways to pay for people's time, offer travel support and honoraria, uh, because this is one of the ways that we can help bring in folks who may not have the time or the resources set aside to be able to do that um, in normal circumstances. Um, we want to continue. We've done a lot of experimentation with virtual events during the pandemic. And you know, we've learned through that the need of offering some kind of hybrid or virtual option, again, to include people from all around the world or folks who may not be able to fly out to Seattle or wherever we're having the event. We want to do more in the space of recognizing people's time. You know, In the early days of these events, there was a lot of energy and volunteer time that went into it. And um, you know, this isn't always an equitable way of, of working in this, in this space. We wanna be finding new ways to recognize the time, especially of graduate students and postdoc students, uh, researchers 
who are um, coming in and have a lot of other obligations. Uh, we want to continue uh, not only to offer funding and maybe different ways of recognizing that work. And then finally, um, continuing to ask people for feedback, listen to that feedback carefully, that evaluation piece is so important, and then acting on that, really trying new things, trying to respond to the things that we're hearing so that we can continue um, to assess, you know, how well are people feeling like they belong at our events, and what can we do to foster that community going forward. These are the offerings uh, for 2023 that are currently planned. Um, a couple of events funded by NASA at the top there, fo focusing on uh, snow and glaciers and ice. Um, there's a, a Nero, it's called Nero Academy. It's actually a two week event and um, Ocean Hack Week. All of these are being offered in the summer. Um, and we've got a couple of other events as well that are that are pending. So um, we're really interested to hear from community members. Uh, if you are interested in participating in an event, or if you'd like to think about how can I partner with the science in putting a similar event on, we're really interested in hearing from you. Um, you can contact us and learn more about the programs at our website, escience.washington.edu or feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address. And I just wanna also acknowledge all of the support we've had over the years from the Moore and Sloan Foundations, uh, NASA and the eScience Institute that have helped us to build this work over the years. So thank you. Um, but I can get things kicked off with a couple of questions if my voice holds out. Um, so the first question I have is there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of overlap um, in some ways between what's happening with XDs and Hack Weeks and Carpentries. And I think you all have kind of touched on this, that, that these all flow into one another. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the broader ecosystem of informal training in this sort of data science or data science adjacent space. Um, and two questions for each of you. Who else is out there doing this kind of work that, that folks who are listening should turn their eyes to also. Um, and the second question, which is maybe harder, uh, is uh, how cohesive does this ecosystem seem right now? And what can we as a broader community who's interested in informal training do to draw all of those training opportunities and organizations together to provide more cohesive training ecosystem? So I'll let the three of you take that question uh, as you will. I can, I can start. I don't have a lot to add, but, um, one of the, I, I've been seeing a lot at societies and conferences. They've been kind of independently for domain trying it themselves, and they may not be aware of the different styles of doing this, but I also wanted to, uh, this question was great because while Anthony was talking, I was thinking, oh, we should have a hack week just on, <laughs> on data science training, uh, which is something we could talk about. But there's, it's such a need and the need only is continually growing. So I, I only expect more and more of little, little groups doing it for their specific communities. Um, and yeah, I think it would be great if it, everyone wasn't working redundantly on the same thing. And Sierra, who else is out there doing this kind of stuff that that you want to uh, I mean, draw people's I mean, attention to? These are the three main ones that I can think of, but it's mostly I see, you know, graduate students all coming together and they're kind of just they maybe never heard of carpentries and they just try to start out from themselves. And I think these are really powerful um, ways to do it where they themselves are taking ownership of something. But like Anthony was saying, it's it shouldn't be on <laughs> the early career researchers to be training everyone and their, their time isn't valued and they're not getting the credit they deserve to put these things on. Um, I don't know of another big group, except like I mentioned before, at conferences, they're kind of just trying to build it, build it themselves and, or organizations who are doing it really, really well, like uh, the 
IRC. I forget what IRC stands for. Uh, the U.S. I was just looking it up. U.S. Research Software Sustainability Institute. And I was going to mention that Kyle Niemeyer from IRSI was one of the other uh, invited panelists. They just uh, IRSI and Kyle just received funding to run essentially what would be um, advanced carpentries or something like that. It would be a week long workshop that would be sort of uh, beyond introductory. Um, so they've received funding to do that work over the next couple of years, but Kyle is unavailable for the panel. So yeah, I'm curious what others face. hear about more from others. Yeah, the the number of, um, you know, as I think you, you probably have a sense that the number of different ways that Carpentries has been recombined with other efforts is pretty limitless. <laughs> so, um, you know, I could refer you to any one of our member institutions and every single one of them has some kind of effort that they're recombining their Carpentries work with. Um, that being said, I would say that, you know, one of the one of the shared challenges that we see among different kinds of efforts um, is is that effort of community building of you know I love hearing that that you know about using carpentries training as a way of inviting new members to a community um, and and we're still learning about how to think about this as well um, and so I do want to give a shout out to an organization that has that has really sort of dedicated itself to that problem which is the CSCCE um uh where they provide community for people who are trying to build community um uh, within within research um the center for scientific collaboration and community engagement um as far as other other training efforts that i i i will i will if anyone out there is interested in particularly in microbial genomics um, I know that there is a there is a, a training opportunity that's accepting applications right now that is very carpentries adjacent, and that's the the stamps uh, workshop at MBL, which I will share a link to. But those are the things that occurred to me off the top of my head. But so many possibilities. Uh, before Anthony jumps in, Karen, are there are there any specific initiatives the carpentries are working on to kind of cross pollinate with other groups, or are you so busy with all of the work that you do that that it's hard to find time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh I, I mean yes and yes. It's a uh, it's there we we don't we have we have tendrils out in many directions. We work fairly closely with the CSCCE. We also, you know, each of our members has needs that we're kind of organizing around. Um, we so we have a lot of little relationships, but we don't have any sort of major initiatives at the moment. But I would say there's conversations going pretty regularly, and I would love to see more of them. We're always interested in and open to new ways to collaborate. Great. Yeah, so I'll shout out to uh, the Openscapes program. Uh, Julie Lowndes and Aaron Robinson are doing some amazing work. Um, they've been hired by NASA to develop what they're calling, um, well, it's, it's a champions program. So they work with a cohort of people at the NASA data centers and do fairly intensive work with them to develop their skills and professional development. And then they go back to their data centers and train people working at the data centers. It's a really great model. Um, Julie's written some fantastic papers over the years about uh, the mentorship models and you know increasing kindness in data science uh, just some really uh, fantastic work there's also project pythia an nsf funded uh, effort to uh, train folks on the uh, tools of data science in the geosciences um, so i'll put links to those um, and then to the other question you know i don't know i, I sort of think about long term where what's our goal with all of this work i think ideally maybe some of the tutorial and trainings begin to appear and this is already happening in courses in university curricula and so that we can maybe open up the time that we have when we do meet in person to take advantage of the best of what that has to offer which is that community building and building relationships and you know i'm beginning to wonder if our time at the hack weeks is is being spent as well as it could be if we're spending so much time delivering tutorial content. I'd like to see more of that shift into, I guess, a, a more traditional uh, co coursework space. 
Um, but yeah, the overlap between everything we're doing is is incredible. And I think uh, I'll just as a closing, I'll mention uh, we did for the last couple of years. My colleague Daniela Hubenkoten, who is one of the inventors of the Hack Weeks, has been leading a, a global Hack the Hack Week <laughs> conference uh, where we're partnering with people all around the world, looking at these kinds of events. Say, how do we coordinate? How do we share ideas and harmonize what we're doing? So a lot of that is is ongoing. That's great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We have a question from Yvonne. You want to unmute and ask? Hi. Yes. Um, so glad to to be here today and uh, um, have you all speaking. Um, I'm like Sierra in that I'm an early, very early <laughs> career researcher. I'm actually doing my thesis right now um, and it's in psychology and neuroscience so I'm looking for more computational neuroscience um, skills and it's kind of tough what I found online is more like um, I'm sure you're familiar with neural match academy which is kind of like this a to z course right it's huge and um, as far as taking it on yourself, you can do that, but, um, and availability is limited, I think only summer, if you wanted to try and do it in person. Um, so any, any tips on where we might be able to find some computational neuroscience um, programs? I'm just starting out with R. I know Python is good for it as well, but something that may be more specific to computational neuroscience, as opposed to just, you know, these basic um, R and Python courses. And Anthony, I did look up while I was on hold here for um, yours that you're offering, but it seems like it's more towards, um, it's asking for previous experience, like what's your GitHub username and do you, have you participated in offering any code? And I'm, you know, here at the beginning stages. So any help in, in that regard? Yes, I'll just say that, um, so I'm a little bit peripheral to the Nero Academy work, so I don't know all the details, but um, I wouldn't let those, those are kind of questions that relate to just uh, getting people access to a lot of the tools as well. I wouldn't let that um, sway you from applying to that particular event, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with the organizers to, to learn more, but I I believe that there's an effort to really welcome people in at, at, at all different levels. And it kind of gets to what we talked about, you know, um, brushing up or getting to a, a, a certain level prior to an event like that, say through a Carpentries or something, would be really, I think, suitable to get you in a position where you could really benefit from, from the event. But I'd be happy to speak offline about that. Great. Thank you. Sierra, I know that. There are some folks affiliated with bids who are uh, neuro adjacent. Is there any work happening in that space? Uh, I imagine with image XP there is um, some neuro overlap. And then Karen, I wonder, are there uh, curricula or you know data carpentries that are focused around neuro data? That would be of interest. Yeah, I don't know. For sure, at the XDs, there's always neuro people, especially at Image XD. Um, I don't know a particular community, but I just want to echo what Anthony says, and then also uh, what Karen said in her or her talk that you don't those recommendations. You should just go out there. <laughs> None of these organizations have put those questions or requirements to keep people out. Um, and one of the best ways that I learned computational skills was through teaching. So software carpentry and data carpentry, I don't know if I was ready to be teaching those courses or being an instructor, but I found that it was really helpful for myself to learn them, to be able to teach them in appropriate ways. So getting involved with software carpentry, even if you feel like you're just a beginner, those that expertise is greatly needed for everyone else, and it'll really help you gain those skills, but also be confident that you have those skills. Yeah, um, I, intermediate means different things. This is one reason why we don't do intermediate training <laughs> because intermediate <laughs> means different things to everyone, right? So if you run an intermediate workshop, 
and you're going to get some people who know this, some people who know that, and and everybody who doesn't know something. Um, and so it's you're definitely not going to be the only one here who doesn't know X or Y or Z. Um, it's it's a challenge. Um, I we do not have official curricula in neuroscience, but it looks like there are a couple of things in development in the incubator. I cannot vouch for uh, the quality or completeness of anything that's in the incubator, but if you go here and just search for neuro, you can see what's there and see if there's anything that might be there to walk through or maybe somebody to contact. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly. It's Michele, but Michelle also works. I have a question. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> and my first question is regarding uh, multidiscipline groups. So we run FOSS, Foundational Open Source Science, here at the University of Arizona, which is a uh, weekly workshop. And we have people coming from different backgrounds to learn about open source science. And I was wondering, because this is quite cross, uh, cross domain, we have issues. I wonder if there is anything that you have learned over your own experiences on how to mitigate people's issues when they come, when there is this group of very different people uh, with different backgrounds. Does that make sense? Okay, one. And then my second question is for Anthony. Anthony, you talked about your workshop where it goes from here is um, how to approach the data. And then two days later, this is how you do ML. How difficult is it? Or what are the difficulties that you run into going from here is the data to here is how you use the data, but in a very advanced way. Do people get lost and how do you mitigate that? Do people walk away? Do you feel people walk away feeling um, like they, 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 they have learned something? Is there people that have to contact you about it afterwards? Thank you very much everyone for your time today. And start. Um, what issues were you referring to? Just to clarify, you mean um, issues that participants have with um, coming together in a community? So the first question was more like, okay, this is a little bit of a background, but people come to this uh, workshop series for us not knowing what open science is about, and then they are introduced to open science. And there is some parts of open science that might be more useful to one group of people and some open sciences topics that are more useful to other people. And sometimes they don't see eye to eye when they ask questions and that might raise quote unquote issues where some people might learn more, some people might learn less, for example, in a specific uh, in a specific lesson. So this is kind of like my own um, uh, my own problems that I have seen. So I was wondering if there is problems that you have seen over time that uh, you might have addressed or I hope I'm getting my point across here. Yeah. Karen or Sierra, do you want to start things off? Yeah, I think I think those challenges that you had, and I, especially with the uneven qualifications coming in, like some people have specialties in one aspect and some people have specialties in another one and teaching open science. So my focus was on computational reproducibility, which is a very like hard, very difficult thing to teach multidisciplinary because every community has a specific standard every team has a specific standard. Um, and there's honestly not a really easy way to do that besides talking 
through these standards like Annie was Anthony was saying it, it all comes down to community and people and unfortunately there's no magic tool to get everyone up to the same speed um to understand where everyone is even at or what they know without just sitting down and talking and having those conversations so I really like how you mentioned, Anthony, that when you're bringing people together, we should maybe be spending this time doing that sort of thing. I can, me at bids, me and two other people were having those same problems when we were approaching how people actually do data science within research. Um, and a lot of it came down to balancing the people you work with. What are their expertise? What is their motivations? What do they need to get credit for? Um, and so when they come into these classes, when you're trying to teach them, they're, they're coming from all over the place. Uh, and I, we wrote a paper, let me get the link, that's all about just like working on a team for data science workflows and how to go through that cycle. Um, and within it, there's a lot of ways to ask these types of questions within uh, yourself, what you need from this data analysis, what you need from open science, what your you know immediate lab needs, and then what does your community need and how to really um, have these discussions. Because it really all comes down to people. There's no magic like checklist. You can never have one. Technologies change rapidly. What was last week, last year's like best practice becomes like the worst practice in a few years <laughs> what i've seen over the years so it's really just like conversation and talking to people yeah i guess i i would second that it's very um you know, our our approach again is to focus very much on the entry level and to, and to stay out of the weeds up there. Um, but I have also seen, um, you know, I think I think that the essential thing is when when you are engaging in intermediate level training is to is to keep that novice perspective in mind and to be sure that you are you are providing enough structure to to at least you know maybe maybe people aren't going to learn every single thing but you're gonna but maybe they're gonna have to copy and paste the code and maybe they're just gonna be able to sort of see that they can do it so that they can learn it later and develop a sense of motivation and empowerment um so making sure that your goals are consistent and achievable for everyone who comes we find that you'll you'll be pretty surprised at how willing sort of more advanced learners are to to suffer through um, some things that that may be more elementary for them. Often you're validating skills that they've taught themselves and and they're actually really excited to see that. Um, so so we encourage people to to really kind of lean towards favoring um, that 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 novice perspective, you know, even when you do extend beyond um, and and be, because the consequences of harming someone um, and sort of sending them running when they really do get confused are, are much greater than the consequences of of boring somebody for a little while or maybe being a little disappointed that they didn't get all the way to where they wanted to go. Great, thank you. Um, questions from attendees? I can also keep asking questions because I'm good at flapping my gums. Um, I don't see any hands raised right now. So I do want to ask uh, each of the panelists a question with two parts um, and take these as you will. Uh, see if there's one in the chat. Oh, there's a question in chat? Oh, hey, yeah, I'll well, do that first. So the question is, where can I find training on using cloud-based computational platforms for classroom instruction, e.g. GitHub Codespaces, Replit, et cetera? Any thoughts on that? I know that Berkeley, I'll try to, try to find a link, but Berkeley has experimented a lot with cloud-based in, instruction, especially with um, Jupyter. Jupiter Labs and the whole Jupiter ecosystem, but they also have the the undergrad education team has a conference every year. So I'm going to try to find that link. Um, I'm sure that they're gathering knowledge from that meeting every year and putting it somewhere. But yeah, it's that's one of that's one of the areas that is 
every year it changes and the software evolves so fast. So it is very difficult to be on top of it all. But let me find that link. Great. Anything from Karen or Anthony on that? There's also a cloud bank, which I'll link here. It may be a little bit more researcher focused, but a lot of tools and trainings on using the cloud. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and Sarah will uh, find a link and drop that <clears throat> in the chat here in a second. So my my question to the panelists is, was going to be about, um, you know, what comes next for folks who are listening here? Um, you know, in, in some cases, the programs that you've described, uh, each of you, um, so specifically Hack Week, the next these are really location dependent, right? The XDs rotate locations, but it's always like you have to go somewhere to do an XD. And the Hack Weeks, this is a, a University of Washington thing, at least for now, although maybe the Hack Weeks as a service uh, model pushes it out of the Seattle area a little bit. Um, Karen, the the carpentry's instruction is happening all over the place, and I'm sure if people were to look, they would maybe be able to find something in their town. But what I'm wondering is two things. One, how can people bring uh, the program that you're here representing to their institution? Is that possible? And what would it look like to try to make that happen? Um, and second, what would it look like for someone at a home institution um, to try to stand one of these things up on their own, to stand up a hack week or to um, take some of the curriculum from the carpentries and, and uh, you know, start, start running workshops. Um, maybe talk about how people can bring what we're talking about here home to where they're doing their research and, and, um, and so on. I can, I can jump in. I mean, I think what you're describing, Steve, is kind of the ideal goal uh, of sort of long term. It would be great to see people having the capacity to come together and spin up, you know, a participant driven community as the needs dictate. Okay, so we really as a community need to learn this. We're going to employ these tools that have been developed through all the programs that we've described and folks will will have you know the resources that they need to do that references papers um, websites showing you know to guide people through that process so that our role now can be ideally diminished over time you know that's that's the ideal so i think on our end that what that looks like is for us to create documentation to share out to folks what we're learning what are the best practices what can you know uh, minimize the time that it takes to go from an idea like that to actually implementing it and so i just see that as taking some time over the years but uh then we just want to hear from all of you on the community like what what are you seeing do these models still fit well for you how can they be shifted to adapt to to what's what's occurring in your communities Here in or Sierra? I, I mean, we, this has kind of been repeated, but just putting yourself out there and finding, like I said in my PowerPoint, the good people. Like, there are people within your department, people who are in maybe in your city, our ladies' chapters. Find that one person who you work well with and start working with them. And then slowly but surely, you will build something with them and people will see that and they will want to join you. Like, don't wait for a community to start, like put yourself out there and do that. I know that's how, that's what really, that's how I started doing everything. I, I just was putting myself out there and, you know, fangirling over someone on the internet and realizing that they're way more approachable than they, they seem <laughs> you know it's a, it's a, it's really a small community out there and if you have a website just make a tutorial that you think you're like oh everyone already knows how to do this that's not true like anything you put out there someone's going to find and be like oh god this is exactly what i needed and 
you just need to find the people to kind of start it yourselves. Um, you don't need, it's like baby steps. You don't need to start a whole like hack week institutional, like hack week. You didn't talk a lot about it, but it likely started with a conversation with like three or four people saying, we really want this to happen. And they kind of, you know, sat together on computers for a good year kind of chatting before anything actually turned into that. So it all starts with like baby steps and finding the really good people that you get along with. And yeah, from a carpentry's perspective, um, my my slides included a lot of links. So I put a link back in my slides. Um, probably the hardest thing to do as far as entering is actually finding a, like if you wanna join a workshop as a learner, um, either your institution is hosting one or they aren't, you can, you can order one, but um, that, you know, that requires that you seek out funding and stuff. I will, we do have a list of upcoming workshops. So if you aren't aware of, a, of one happening near you, um, you can sometimes find out that one is happening, um, but they aren't, you generally, these aren't posted as sort of an anybody can join kind of thing. You have to be affiliated with that local institution to join. Um, but we are, you know, as I mentioned, our instructor community, our global community is primarily made up of our instructors. And we are very, very welcoming to people who are pretty early in their learning process. So a lot of people who go through instructor training don't necessarily know that they're ready to be instructors, but they but but they're willing to kind of go through it and think about it. Um, and eventually they get there. Maybe if, as part of a local community, they might have an opportunity to help out as a workshop. Um, we can also connect people as as helpers if if they want to. Um, but yeah, there are there are lots of different ways to get involved. We're a very welcoming community, um, and yeah, um, being an deciding to become an instructor before you think you're ready um, is is a great way to to take that dive, um, as Sierra was saying. Absolutely true. That's how I learned most of my R is by having to teach people with data carpentry. Um, any other questions from the audience? or any parting words or pearls of wisdom that the panelists would like to offer? Well, I'll offer some pearls of wisdom and then we'll close things out. Um, I do wanna thank you all for coming and I'd like to thank all of the the um, the panelists for being here. It's It's uh, been great to hear from you all and to hear about you know what's going on in this space. Um, keep an eye out uh, at each of these organizations for upcoming events um, or resources that you could make use of at your home institution. Um, and please do reach out to me at academicdatascience.org um, or to any of the panelists if you have any questions or follow-ups. I plan to uh, provide a link to the recording here uh, along with hopefully slide decks for each of our panelists uh, once we have uh, the recording all processed and I'll send that out to all the registrants. Um, so again, thanks everyone. A uh, round of applause for the speakers uh, and it's been great having you here today.